Lisa? You're good to go. Okay. Hello. I hope everyone out there can hear me. Uh, this may be new for some of our OLLI members. Um, this webinar is being presented uh, by OSHA, the OSHA Lecture Series, as part of the OSHA Lecture Series from OSHA Lifelong Learning Institute at California State University, Dominguez Hills. I am Nicole Picotta, your interim OLLI program, and I welcome you today. Today, um, in our panel, we have, um, I will be introducing the individuals as they will appear. Um, but before I do that, I want to thank uh, the people that made this happen. First, our appreciation to Ambassador Andrew Young, um, who made some concessions and moved things around in order to be able to be with, here, be with us today. We are very appreciative of that. I'd like to also thank the College of Extended and International Education, Dr. Linda Wilson and Dean Kim McNutt, for allowing Ollie to have this opportunity to bring this um, forward. I'd also like to thank the um, Negotiation, Conflict Resolution, and Peace Building Program with Dr. Brian Jarrett. Um, that is uh, my program of study, and as a part of Mediation and Conflict Resolution, we were able to bring this program to you. So moving forward, the first person that I'd like to introduce to you is adjunct professor and my mentor, Ambassador Stephen Rhodes. Ambassador Stephen Rhodes um, not only teaches here, but he's also an adjunct professor at Loyola Marymount. Um, he has been my mentor for, um, for years, and I appreciate um, everything that he does for me. We want to be sure that we're conscious of our time, and without further ado, Ambassador Young. Excuse me, Ambassador uh, Rhodes. I apologize, Ambassador Rhodes. I'm looking uh, at Ambassador Young. Well, thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Ambassador Young. Um, in 1957, a group of poor kids from Monterey, Mexico, won the Little League Baseball Championship. In 1961, a movie was made about the team entitled, How Tall is a Giant? We have a giant with us today. It's been said that George Washington was first in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen. But if you know anything about Ambassador Young, you'd put him there. Thomas More, St. Thomas More, was a, great, was a man of great religious faith and integrity who refused to support Henry VIII's marriage of Catherine of Aragon. His integrity costed him his life, and he will further be known as a man for all seasons. So is our speaker. Roger Kipling in his poem, If, captures some of the aspects of Ambassador Young's character. Let me just read two of them to you. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can walk with crowds and keep your virtue or walk with kings nor lose the common touch. This is Ambassador Young. To be a good general, you must be a good lieutenant. Ambassador Young was an excellent lieutenant, lieutenant for Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's army. He should be wearing five stars on his shoulders now. In an interview with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, Ambassador Young talked about the mantra that he adopted from Reverend Dr. King, service to others. I've been educated by the Jesuits who followed the same mantra, service to others to the greater glory of God. I'm a Jorium Dei Gloria. Ambassador Young and I have something else in common. He's a New Orleanian. He graduated from Gilbert Academy. He attended Dillard University and graduated from Howard University. He earned a divinity degree from Hartford Seminary. Unfortunately, however, he's a member of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity when he could have been a great member of Kappa Alpha Psi. I met Ambassador Young after he was elected to the office of mayor in 1981. He was always honest and straightforward with me when I would call him to talk about what was happening in Atlanta. 
to show you the type of selfless individual he is, before I arrived in Zimbabwe, Ambassador Young called President Mugabe on my behalf, and as a result, I was well received by President Mugabe and the government of Zimbabwe. So how tall is a giant? It's Andrew Jackson Young Jr.'s height. Ambassador Young has been first in the battle for justice, freedom, and equality in the United States and on the world stage. He has walked with kings nor lost a common touch. He is a man for all seasons. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to meet, listen, and enjoy one of our greatest Ambassador Andrew Jackson Young Jr. Thank you very much. <clears throat> We're living at a, as we say, the best of times and the worst of times. Things are happening so fast. Uh, it's very hard to kind of keep them in order. I was fortunate to have, have been born time like this. And I started out in New Orleans, Louisiana. And I, I guess I was destined to be an ambassador because I was living in the middle of a block and on one corner was an Irish grocery store. On another corner was the Italian bar. On the third corner, the headquarters of the Nazi party. Uh, and around the fourth corner was a Chevrolet dealership. Uh, there were a few black families living in that neighborhood, uh, but my brother and, and I were probably the only uh, black children uh, so, uh, we had to move from that neighborhood, um, to another neighborhood, uh, to go to an all black segregated school. Uh, but, um, I've been living with this problem now, uh, for 88 years. And I was fortunate that my father, uh, had an opportunity to grow up in a similar kind of situation in Franklin, Louisiana. And I don't know how it happened, but uh, his family was able to see to it that he got out of Franklin, Louisiana and got to uh, straight college in New Orleans where he met my mother uh, and then went to Howard University. And next year, would be his 100th anniversary uh, as a graduate of Howard University's dental school. So that makes me uh, somewhat privileged uh, growing up in the South and, and yet being protected from most of the things that um, we had to live with in other parts. New Orleans always happened to be a little more cosmopolitan than say Atlanta. Uh, the first time I saw the Ku Klux Klan was when I went to Atlanta uh, at 14 uh, to a YMCA conference. And the Ku Klux Klan was riding down uh, Auburn Avenue which was the main street in the black community in those days. I'd never seen that in New Orleans, but um, living on the corner 50 yards from the headquarters of the Nazi party, I had to, uh, I got my first lessons on racism and uh, white supremacy when I was about four, because my father used uh, Jesse Owens in the 1936 Olympics uh, as a role model for me to, uh, how do you get along with white supremacy? And uh, he said to me, white supremacy is a sickness and you don't let sick people get you upset. 
uh, you uh, you know that God made of one blood all the nations of the earth, uh, and that uh, they don't want to accept that. But you don't have to argue with anybody about it, uh, and you don't ever let anybody make you angry. Uh, his mantra was, don't get mad, get smart. Uh, your mind is the most powerful and important weapon you have. And he took me to the movies to see Jesse Owens. And when Jesse Owens won the 100 meter dash and set a new world record, becoming the world's fastest human, uh, rather than giving him his medal, Adolf Hitler, walked out of the stadium uh, and took all of his stormtroopers with him. Uh, my father was quick to point out that uh, if Jesse Owens had gotten upset about that, it might have interfered with his, the rest of his performance, but he ignored Hitler uh, and just went on and won three more gold medals. Uh, uh, setting a total of four. And he said, uh, you'll be surrounded by sick people all your life, uh, but um, you have to stay in control and don't ever get excited or upset. He was a little guy. He said, I'm just about five, four. So you're never going to be big enough to beat everybody. And you might uh, be able to outrun a lot of people, um, but uh, you won't feel good about running from fights. So you need to learn self-control and you need to learn to think your way through crises. Well, I've been trying to do that now uh, for another 80 years. Uh, and it's been the only thing that's been successful for me. Uh, it, um, it's the way I understand where we are now. I see us at a juncture of um, three, different, uh, three different crises, maybe four. Uh, <clears throat> and we have little or no control over any of them at this point. One is the, um, the presence of a virus uh, that we were not prepared for, that the government tried to deny out of existence, but that has really crippled uh, the world. Uh, but it meant that people were not at work. People were at home uh, in quarantine uh, when a race crisis emerged. Uh, the death of George Floyd was very much like the uh, beating of John Lewis and Hosea Williams and 300 other people on the bridge at uh, Selma. It happened on a, at a time when a lot of people were at home. Uh, there was a snowstorm in the north and east. Uh, and so everybody saw that. Everybody in the world uh, was focused on nine minutes of murder. Uh, and for no reason at all, but it created an awareness of white supremacy in action uh, so that nobody could deny it. Everybody had to deal with it. Um, but that's not all that these things together um, have shut down our economy. 
Uh, the economy was doing fairly well, uh, but um, we probably now have 30 million people jobless. Um, the virus was not just a United States problem. Uh, it happened to be a global problem. And so I got calls from friends in Italy uh, who were under quarantine uh, Tanzania, uh, Malawi. I read about people um, in Australia. Uh, and uh, But what happened was with everybody focusing, being focused by this virus uh, and being forced in a way to watch white supremacy in action, uh, it created a crisis, uh, but it's not the only crisis. The other crisis has uh, been looming for a long time and we've been denying that too, and that is a climate crisis. Uh, you know about the fires in California, uh, but uh, some of the same phenomena are causing the hurricanes. We're on our 11th hurricane now, uh, and usually the hurricanes don't start until this time uh, in August and September. Uh, so there have already been 11 of them, I think. Uh, and there's several others out in the ocean. So that you, you have race, health, the economy and climate. And so we're at a, we're at a critical juncture, juncture in the history of humankind. Uh, we've been able and could maybe focus on any one of these things, uh, but now we've got probably leadership that refuses to lead, that has tried to deny uh, the existence of every reality rather than understand it or address it. Uh, and um, we've got an election coming up in, what, 79 days? Uh, and uh, You have given us uh, one of the candidates for vice president, uh, and um, she went to the Howard University, uh, the place that I stumbled through. Uh, so uh, she, she got through with glory and honor. Uh, I made it, oh, thank you, Lordy. Um, but um, We're in a position now that whether we like it or not, we probably know more about race, and that's everybody on the call. Um, we wouldn't be here if we hadn't been living with these problems. We're probably uh, sensitive to uh, the health crises because this is not the first health crisis we've had. There was an Ebola crisis uh, five years ago, and uh, we've had influenza almost every year, and we've had, since 1979 or 80, we've had a, a HIV AIDS crisis. Um, all of these um, are viruses that are somewhat related to each other, and we we, we really haven't had a good medical way of uh, dealing with them. Uh, they continue uh, to rage all over the world. Uh, and so whatever we've been doing so far has 
been weighed in the balance and found warning. And we've got uh, the opportunity of a lifetime. Uh, and I'd rather say it's an opportunity rather than a crisis because the two are basically the same. Uh, it becomes a crisis when you deny it and run from it. Uh, when you embrace it uh, and see it as a chance to restructure the world in which we live. And I guess I was impressed last night uh, with the opening night of the uh, Democratic Convention. Uh, and what impressed me was the way that the whole nation seemed to be ready to take on the challenges of the future, at least those that were on the call this week. Uh, next week, it'll be very interesting to see what what comes up there. But there's no escaping any of these crises. We're going to have to find a way to deal with them. And um, I got thrown into uh, politics when Dr. King died. And it was not something I wanted, not something I was prepared for, but um, I guess I was more prepared than I thought uh, because uh, living with Martin Luther King for 10 years or so, very closely, there was a crisis a week. Uh, and so you, you get used to the fact that you're dealing with one crisis after another. We never had any money. We never had any plans. Uh, he had he was had the capacity to uh, articulate uh, in a great speech um, enough of an analysis and enough faith in this country. Uh, and in, as he called it, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And his, one of his favorite phrases was, truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. But that scaffold sways the future because beyond the dim unknown standeth God within the shadows, keeping watch above his own. Now, I learned to believe that uh, working with him. He may have known what we, he was doing, but almost every incident in the civil rights movement was something that happened spontaneously, like the death of George Floyd. Uh, and we were put in a position where we had to respond. There's no way we could have anticipated and planned, but it always, it always worked out better than we could have imagined. And so I tend to think of these kinds of difficult times uh, as opportunities if you face them. And if you accept the challenge of health, of race, of uh, climate, uh, and of reconstructing a global economy, I'll just say one thing. Uh, one of the, there was, a, there could have been a similar crisis about, uh, six years ago, six, eight years ago with Ebola. Uh, and, uh, and yet um, President Obama uh, put the national security staff in charge of it. And they moved quickly to take almost half of the Center for Disease Control from Atlanta 
and moved it to the African continent very quickly. And they got on top of this Ebola crisis and it almost never got here. I think only less than half a dozen people in the US uh, came down with Ebola, although it was devastating much of Africa. Uh, and uh, we didn't cure Ebola, but we were able to have good enough relations with people on the African continent. The World Health Organization, which was unprepared, but with the help of the Center for Disease Control and with the aggressiveness of the Obama administration, uh, they found some way to keep it under control. And most of us, you know, don't know much about it at all on the ground. Uh, we never had to deal with it. Uh, this administration did exactly the opposite. It tried to wish it away. Uh, and it's impossible to wish any of these problems away. And so I think that uh, we don't want to make the mistake. We don't want to repeat the mistakes that have already been made. And so the challenge for us now is to see the opportunities uh, that come with these crises. Now, one of the couple of books I've been reading uh, have affected my thinking in different ways. One is a, a book on the, uh, the color of money uh, by, uh, sounds like an Indian name, uh, who I was not familiar with, but it's a very good book because it's an economic analysis of this country's race problem. Uh, the other one is, uh, the future is faster than you think, uh, which comes from one of the guys up in San Francisco that had something to do with the founding of Google, I think, uh, Peter Diamandis. And what I sense in that is that um, there are two possible ways that our lives are going to be impacted. They're going to be impacted in the ways that we've talked about as a result of these problems and these crises. But there's also an opportunity in the emergence of technology, uh, in the presence of capital, in the conversion of uh, differing technologies like artificial intelligence uh, and nanotechnology, oh, they're gonna be coming together. They are already coming together uh, and they will bring a whole new way of looking at things. Um, we have lived through more change in our lifetime uh, than has existed almost in the rest of the, the time that this nation has been in existence. Things have been going so fast, but I don't think they're going to slow down at all. I think they're going to pick up. And so, um, Fasten your seat belts. Uh, you, you're in for um, one hell of a ride. But um, again, going back to the way my daddy raised me, uh, don't get emotional about it. Don't get upset. Don't get angry. Uh, all of those uh, self defeating emotions. Uh, you've got to be calm. You've got to be rational. Uh, and you've got to find a way to open yourselves to, well, to the spirit of God in your life. You did not create yourself. Uh, you are not here by accident. Um, I preached Sunday and uh, one of the songs they sang is uh, that I hadn't heard in a long time. The creator has a master plan. 
Uh, and um, I was going to talk about one thing, and when they started talking about the Creator has a master plan, all of a sudden it shifted my whole sermon. Uh, because I was about to give my solutions and my analysis, but uh, what I say and what I think really is can never be important and it is irrelevant, but you are a part of some master plan and how that is awakened in you and around us. Uh, is basically the life that uh, we have been given. None of us really uh, chose it, uh, but uh, we can't uh, we can't run from it. So I say, tighten your seat belts and uh, uh, put on your knee pads and get ready to. Uh, get ready to do a lot of praying uh, and be in for a rough ride. But uh, we shall overcome. Thank you, Ambassador Young. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, this is enlightening. Um, that, that's definitely what we said we wanted to bring, and we appreciate your words. And I think you said the color of money and the future is faster than you think. Um, so we'll make sure we might put that on our reading list. Next, I'd like to introduce to you, Ambassador Young, and to our audience, Dr. Donna Nichols. Dr. Donna Nichols is going to be joining Ambassador Young in discussion. Dr. Donna Nichols uh, is um, at California State University, Dominguez Hills. She is the chair of Africana Studies Department at, at the university. She was the first woman of color to earn her tenure and promotion in women and gender studies at California State Fullerton before before coming to Dominguez Hills in 2017. She earned her doctorate degree in history and philosophy of education from, the Ohio, from Ohio State University. And her research focuses on racism and sexism within um, higher education. She is particularly interested in the ways African-American men and women have subverted into institutionalized discrimination within academic hollow halls by developing alternative forms of academic leadership and teaching pedagogy, which she uses in African-American culture as a form of resistance to prevailing ideas on how universities should operate. Dr. Nichols, thank you very much for joining us. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Nicole, for that introduction. And thank you again, Ambassador Young, for joining us here today. Um, I am truly honored to be able to uh, facilitate this discussion. Uh, when Nicole and I were discussing this, um, and she said, you know, I, I can make some contact with, you know, Ambassador Young's office. I just, you know, almost like a little fangirl, uh, got really excited because as a historian who teaches a class in Black movements of the 60s, it is just amazing to be able to talk to and bear witness to your experience and what you have seen as an eyewitness to history. And so we just had a couple of questions. Uh, really what the uh, intent of all of this is to kind of frame a discussion around intergenerational social activism. Um, there has been a desire by the Ali members to learn more about this kind of present moment in Black Lives Matter, but to begin to understand the, that current moment, you really need to go back and contextualize what has happened before. And so Ambassador Young, if you don't mind, I have a few questions. Um, it, it's, you know, you just take it from there after we sure. ask questions. And um, the first one is this, um, Claiborne Carson, who's the director of the King Institute at Stanford University has characterized the work of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference as following the course of moderation with regards to politics. But having lived and breathed SCLC, uh, for so many years, would you characterize the work that you did as a moderate approach or maybe something else? Well, it, it was it was anything but moderate for us because uh, almost everything we did 
uh, every move we made, almost any decision could cost you your life. Uh, and um, we were, the only thing that might label us as moderate is I would call intelligence. We had sense enough to realize that we're 13% of the population, um, that we had no weapons, we had little or no wealth, um, that we were in a democracy that was, that we could not change, we could not overthrow, but we could modify it. But in order to make a change, uh, you either had to have economic power or political power. Mm -hmm. Political power required, and still does, 60% opinion change in the country. So I think that um, for Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King to start a bus boycott that would change the way people use transportation around their cities, uh, or that Fred Shuttlesworth and Martin Luther King in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, could take on, I mean, there had been 60 unsolved bombings of black people's homes in Birmingham the year before we started the movement there in 1963. Uh, Fred Shuttlesworth's church had been bombed three times. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't think it was moderate, <laughs> you know, to pack up and leave your family uh, and go there and take that system on with uh, with no money, no guns, uh, no political power, uh, but with a faith in God and the human spirit. Uh, to believe that we could mobilize enough attention uh, locally and nationally uh, to bring about significant social change, lasting social change. Um, and it was, it was really very simple. Um, and I'm not sure that any of the writers and historians understand how, well, when we got there, one of the first things that Dr. King said to me was, because he knew what kind of neighborhood I grew up in, uh, and I had, had also been in New York working with the National Council of Churches and uh, had a similar kind of seminary education, he said, do you know any white folks in Birmingham? I said, you know, I, I really don't know. And he said, well, why don't you see if you can find some? <laughs> and I said, well, what, what for? He said, well, we need to talk to people and help them to understand what we're going to do here and why we're going to do it. Well, I, I it came to me that I had met uh, somebody who worked for the Episcopal Church once in Birmingham. So I called the uh, Episcopal Church Diocesan House and asked if the director of Christian education was there. And it turned out that this was the person that I had met at a conference in Michigan a couple of years before. And I asked her to set up a meeting with the bishop and Dr. King, and that started a negotiation process even before we started demonstrating. Uh, and uh, But we explained to them what we were going to do, why we were going to do it, uh, and we asked them, well, the way Dr. King put it was that, look, you can't help it that you were born white and we were born black. Uh, but we can do something about the fact that we were born in an unjust relationship to each other. Mm -hmm. And we can, we can restructure the relationship to each other. And uh, they said, well, what do you mean by, by that? Well, 
we're not going to spend our money if we can't work. Um, we're not going to spend our money anywhere that you have signs that say white water, white and colored on a water fountain. Uh, that's insulting to us. Uh, and, and we went on and we're not going to buy clothes from a place where we can't eat at a lunch counter or get a Coca-Cola glass of water. Uh, but by spelling out, and we can't continue to cooperate with this system um, if we don't have equal education opportunity and if we don't have uh, a right to vote that allows us to participate in the decision making. Now, that's quite an agenda, but that was on the table before the demonstration started. Um, and that, that was considered quite radical in 1963. Can I, uh, interrupt you, Ambassador? Mm -hmm. I, I think, and forgive me, Dr. Nichols, mm -hmm. uh, we deal with young people who don't understand how radical it was to go up against the Jim Crow laws of the South. Mm -hmm. Anytime you did anything like that, it was radical. Mm -hmm. that, I, I just wanted to, to get that out. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. The other thing, though, was that, that we thought, we did not think of um, Black Panthers as particularly radical. I mean, they, were, they had a radical language. But basically, um, it was very hard to see any change that was wrought through that kind of language. In fact, in the South, if we had been walking around with guns or even talking violence, I mean, I, I said there'd been 60 bombings and nobody had been arrested. Uh, there probably were 60 killings that didn't even make the newspaper. Uh, we were in a battle zone. And so the fact that we talked um, very, very moderate and understated um, was just the only way you had a chance to communicate. Now, I, I should go on to say, to remind you that this was in January 1963. Uh, before June 1963, we had 100 businessmen in Birmingham, Alabama, agree to everything we asked. And Birmingham, Alabama desegregated a full year before the Congress got around to even uh, getting a civil rights bill together. And so if you look at Birmingham now, uh, or Atlanta, uh, Atlanta's had six black mayors. Uh, Birmingham has had four or five. Uh, the town, has, the city has been totally transformed. Uh, as has Atlanta. Um, and um, we still have problems, but the problems are that we did so well, I think, that when Gary had problems uh, that they couldn't solve, or when uh, Detroit law began to lose the automobile industry, uh, Newark began to have problems. People from all over came here. New Orleans had was hit by Katrina. Uh, it seemed like uh, close to 100,000 people from New Orleans came to Atlanta. Um, and so we have not solved the problems, uh, but we've grown from less than a million people when I moved there in 1960 
61. And now we're in excess of 6 million. And um, we've built the world's busiest airport. Uh, we put on the world's biggest Olympics. And at the airport, almost half of the money spent started off with 25% minority participation. Now it's about, it's close to 50-50 in terms of the money spent at the airport uh, or through the airport. Um, the same thing um, was true of the Olympics. Uh, we raised two and a half billion dollars privately and 41% of it went to minority owned businesses and contractors. Um, and I, I don't know anybody anywhere in the world doing any better than that. But we're doing it quietly and intelligently. And um, I value progress in terms of dollars, votes, and education. And uh, we're graduating now. In fact, I just finished talking to Georgia State University. Uh, now graduates more black college graduates than any school in the world. Every, for the last three or four years, there are over a thousand, but almost 1,100 black college graduates through Georgia State University. Uh, and uh, I don't think any of the historically black colleges, that's a public university that, uh, that, that right now is doing pretty well. Um, and the institutions that we have taken over, we've tried to make them responsive to the needs of the people that they're supposed to serve. Thank you, Ambassador Young. Um, I asked the question about moderation because I wanted to kind of lead into a discussion about your thoughts on the Black Lives Matter movement as, it, as, as a response to what is happening now. What, what are your overall impressions about the Black Lives Matter movement? I think that the Black Lives Matter movement is a wonderful response um, to the problem of race and police brutality. It's a global response. It went all around the world. Now, when we were organizing, it took us three months almost of organizing with churches, training people in high school and, and the colleges. Uh, and we ended up uh, with 55 people going to jail with Martin Luther King. Uh, Black Lives Matter put together 50,000 people in 15 minutes. Uh, and I, ha I have seen people from New Zealand uh, marching under the banner of Black Lives Matter. Uh, so uh, thanks to these little cell phones uh, and um, the Zoom, and I, I don't know what all they did, but um, it's a massive organizational effort. Uh, but nobody knows, n nobody has yet targeted exactly what response we want for that. Uh, and, and that's not anybody's fault. Uh, we were blessed. I mean, I, I went to see Thurgood Marshall argue a case about race relations in Louisiana when I was nine years old. When I met him, 
with Martin Luther King, I was 29. Uh, he was already taking cases when I was nine. He was already taking issues before the Supreme Court. Uh, and so we had a, we had a national consensus uh, around the courts and around education uh, and around economic participation uh, on an equal basis. Uh, and th those, those were already thought through uh, and there had been scholars and intellectuals, uh, law schools had been having moot court trials, uh, and there was an infrastructure that, that helped us do what we did. That infrastructure is not there in the same way for Black Lives Matter, but they, they're making up for it with the communications that they have. But how you mold that into uh, a consensus that gets 60% of the country to agree with you in order to get change uh, is, <clears throat> well, it, is difficult right now simply because it's so big and it's so successful and but people are doing things that i've never seen them do before their banks are talking about how they put more money into the black community uh, colleges and universities are realizing that they need to do more uh, with minority students um, and that's without any federal guidance. Uh, they have awakened the conscience uh, of the world, uh, but how that's to be directed will probably be left to uh, the next president and vice president. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. We we have they an may have set they may, may they may have be, they may have set the agenda for the next administration. Okay. We ha we have a question from the audience member, uh, Dr. Salim Faraji is a professor of Africana Studies. Dr. Faraji, do you want to ask your question? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, <laughs> Ambassador Young. Let me just say thank you first for. Uh, uh, just being here with us this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are in the country. Um, I appreciate it, you know, very much. And your wisdom, your insight is, is, is greatly appreciated and welcome. Uh, I'm a professor of Africana Studies here at Cal State Dominguez Hills. And uh, uh, Dr. Nickel is, is our chair and my colleague. You know, maybe about two or three years ago, here's my question. About two or three years ago, you made two remarkable uh, documentary videos called Strong Medicine, a two-part series. Strong Medicine, uh, The Secret Power of African Traditional Healing. Uh, and these, these are videos that I have showed students in my African religious class. By the way, I also have uh, a divinity school background uh, as well, uh, like yourself. And so I was just wondering, you know, th those are two very powerful videos. And I was wondering, how do you view the relationship between uh, African indigenous knowledge and our ancestral spirituality in addressing the four crises you identify in terms of race, uh, uh, health, economy, and the climate and, and climate change. Well, you know, how do you see the relationship between what you showed the world in strong medicine and the current crises that we're dealing with now? Oh. Uh, thanks very much for, for looking at those. I, um, you know, I've written, well, maybe three books, but nobody reads them. <laughs> uh, and, um, and I decided that rather than spending time writing books, um, well, it, it was, 
I was traveling around Africa quite a bit then. And um, I, I learned that it was easier for me to take a camera crew and make a film that's 50 minutes long and I could probably reach more people with the film um, than I could writing a book. Uh, and so we've actually done about 15 of those films uh, on almost everything we could think of in Africa uh, and in the United States. Uh, and uh, I, um, I think that, that we've used strong medicine to try to get um, to try to get scientists in this country to realize that vaccines are not the only science. That one of the things we found in that strong medicine was that while we have no AIDS cure here, uh, that in Senegal, uh, in a little village called Fatik, uh, there um, are traditional healers uh, that have been curing AIDS um, in three to six weeks uh, and not charging people very much. And that was at a time when the antiretrovirals were selling at about $900 a month in this country. Uh, and they were almost doing it free in Senegal. And we were trying to get, well, what we did was we got them to give us some of their herbs that they use. And we sent them to Morehouse Medical School. They cooked them down into an extract and we sent the extract to uh, Fort Detrick, Maryland, where they keep all of these live viruses. And they tested this extract in 23 different viruses, uh, HIV, uh, Ebola, uh, Corona, uh, influenza, hepatitis. Uh, there were 23 different. And in every one of those Petri dishes, couple of drops of this extract from these herbs, African herbs, kills it. I mean, kills it. And so we thought that would be enough uh, evidence to get a grant from Morehouse Medical School to do some more research on this sort of thing. Now, the Ford Foundation has tested the patients in uh, fatigue over a 10 year period of time. And of the 60 people that they started with about 15 years ago, um, only one of them had died. Uh, and uh, he was hit by a truck. Uh, and all of the others are living healthy, I mean, healthy, uh, disease free lives. Uh, and with no trace of HIV, which is what they were dying of when the tests were first given. And so we know that there's credibility in other approaches. Uh, and one of the things that we identified was that there's a trace mineral called selenium, which is very rich in the soil in Senegal, and that these herbs seem to be rich in selenium. And so our foundation sent a thousand bottles of selenium uh, tablets, uh, which we bought at Walmart. Um, and we sent them over to Liberia. Uh, and um, because Liberia has a kind of a, well, they have a kind of black segregation where the American Liberians uh, have significant well they're sort of like white folks <laughs> and the indigenous people who have not been to america get the short end of the stick 
And so they were not getting much medical uh, attention and were dying. And so we distributed a thousand bottles of selenium amongst the poorest people. Um, they had a 68% survival rate. And those that were being treated in the fancy hospital uh, that the American uh, medical folk built only had a 44% survival rate. So uh, this time for uh, the corona, the, the Liberian consulate came back to us and said, can you send us some more of that uh, selenium? Because we can't get it in Africa. Uh, it's in the soil, but not in Liberia. Uh, that was up in, uh, in Senegal. Uh, but there are no planes flying there. We were able to put it on a Coca-Cola plane. Coca-Cola was, was sending a, something. Well, one of the executives was going to his office in Liberia. Uh, but we were able to get it in Germany and we sent a boat supply to them, but they didn't get it until, well, till really till the middle of June. And we started, it, it took us from uh, May to the middle of June to get it to them. So we haven't had any reports on it, but uh, I, I just, I mean, I, I just take, uh, Uh, vitamin C, uh, vitamin D3, uh, selenium, and um, green tea extract. Um, now, I started all of this healthy stuff uh, fooling around with Dick Gregory. <laughs> you know, in the movement, Dick Gregory brought us, um, I mean, he brought us a a whole shoebox full of vitamins uh, to uh, Albany, Georgia in 61 or 62. Uh, and I started taking Dick Gregory's vitamins. Uh, and um, I mean, I will get a virus shot when they come up with them. I, I got a flu shot today. Uh, cause at my age, you don't want to fool around, uh, getting anything. Uh, but, um, I, I'm not gonna wait around for a, a vaccine, uh, you know, for Ebola or, well, they still don't have an AIDS vaccine. Uh, and there's, there's been a lot of money to do that. Uh, that, but we have, well, we finished, we wiped polio out of Africa uh, with the help of uh, Bill Gates and uh, the Rotary Clubs uh, and uh, the World Health Organization working together. Uh, I don't think that there's been a, a polio case in Africa for the last three or four years. Uh, so vaccines are important and they do work, but it's not the only science. And there is amongst the traditional healers in Africa, uh, the Native American tribes here, uh, medicines that they've been using. Oh, I also take, uh, what is it? Turmeric, because uh, the Indians don't have Alzheimer's. I had a lot of, a couple of, I had three or four of my friends uh, who, uh, you know, who were younger than me uh, and brilliant men, a couple of physicians and well, a couple of PhDs, and something happened to them, and they they began to lose it. Uh, 
and that doesn't happen as much in India. And I, I understand that one of the reasons they say is because they eat a lot of turmeric in the curry and the curcumin. Uh, the ingredients of curry uh, keeps their blood vessels open in their minds. Uh, and so uh, I found a little uh, a bottle of, I mean, I don't gain Indian food every day, but I, I, I keep a little bottle of turmeric in my pocket. Uh, uh, and, and that's, that's sort of like, uh, well, I don't know, that's folk wisdom, but I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to discount it. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, we wanted to be mindful of time because we are actually over. It's 12, 11, and there is one more question. I uh, wanted to see if you are... Uh, I didn't hear you. Okay, I'm sorry. I said it's uh, 12, 11 or 12, Fine. 12. And so we're over time, but we have one more question and wanted to know if you would be able to stay on sure. uh, to answer that yep. one. Yep. Okay, this question is from Lawrence uh, Rennie. Uh, apologies if I mispronounce your name, uh, but it says, do you think that young people realize the accomplishments of people such as yourself and Dr. King who planted the, seed, the seeds of change? I don't, I don't think they do and I don't expect them to. And the reason is that um, I didn't know much about W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, I ended up, my daddy wanted me to be a dentist, so I was a biology major. Uh, I was at Howard University, but I never, I never met Franklin Frazier and, and uh, I took a course from him. Um, I did know about uh, Charles Drew uh, and blood plasma because uh, I was, you know, I was a, I was a science major, uh, but there's almost no reason that they should know things. Uh, after all, that was 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. And, but that doesn't mean, I think you, you get a, in fact, my book on the movement um, was called An Easy Burden. Uh, and that was written about my life until I went to Congress mm -hmm. in 1970, 72. Um, but um, the book I, I started off with, uh, The Co Color of Money, um, is as good a, it's as good a, a, a story of, from an economic point of view, uh, it's, it's extremely relevant uh, to uh, what we're talking about and what's happening nowadays. Because the answers to I think the answers to Black Lives Matter uh, and um, are, are going to be economic. And Dr. King said that when he organized SCA, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, it was to redeem the soul of America from the triple evils of racism, war, and poverty. Now, racism for us meant uh, legal, segregation, uh, and we changed that. Um, war, we, we haven't stopped all wars, but um, I went from people thinking we were crazy to after my first term in Congress, we were able to stop the war in Vietnam uh, in the Congress. Uh, 
about 1974, three, four. Uh, but we, we have not been able to have a significant impact on poverty. And what you're getting, well, is, you know, what, what's expected of us is that we had 300 years of slavery uh, and, um, and another 100 years of legal segregation. Uh, we still don't have, I mean, for instance, when the GI Bill was written and they first, it was, it was hard for blacks to get into colleges, whereas whites were, were easily to get into college then. Uh, black folk didn't start getting into top flight colleges until after Dr. King's death in 68. Most, most of the people who are going to, well, I don't know when Dominguez Hills was formed, but uh, the, the, the state university network in California was one of the first that, uh, that invested in, uh, in education, making education available as much as possible. But when I was out in California, you could go to UCLA for something like $30 a semester. Um, my wife got her master's degree in when we were living in New York at Queens College in New York. And all she had to pay was $16 uh, registration fee for each semester. <clears throat> so her, her master's cost $32. Now you get a master's and you come out with 300, well, with, with a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of debt almost. Uh, it's hard to come out of school without a debt. So um, all of those things are punitive and they don't make good sense. And if you took the, the, bit, the trillion and a half dollar tax cut uh, that was in last year's uh, tax bill. Um, it very, it did not get to the bottom. Uh, but if you had put, that's exactly the same amount of money uh, that um, would wipe out most student loans. And if you wiped out student loans, all of that money would go directly into the economy some way. And so the, the economists need to sort of spell this out for us that, um, and I like, I like the term um, essential workers because the essential workers concept is a concept that you can get 60% support for possibly. Uh, I think it'd be hard to get 60% support in this country uh, for anything that's going to just help people who are black. And that, I mean, I figured that we're 13% of the population and we may be with all of the good white people that were marching with us, uh, we probably still didn't have 25% of the population. Uh, that is, I don't know what these polls are saying now, but I really don't know that this country is yet ready uh, to address the economic aspects of racism. Uh, and um, you see how complex they are if you, if you, well, actually, um, because my eyes are getting bad and I can't read so fast, I, I've, I've turned to audio books. Uh, and uh, you can get uh, The Color of Money on an audio book. Uh, and um, it, it's, you, you realize that we're dealing with problems 
that are so deep and so complex that you can't address it with a simple slogan, no matter how great that slogan is. And there's, there's never been a better one uh, that has mobilized more people uh, around the world than Black Lives Matter. Uh, but slogans don't count until you transfer it into votes or money. And in order to transfer the sl any slogan into votes or money and money, you got to get 60% of the people in this country agreeing with you. Thank you. Um, in fact, the name of the author of the book that you're referring to is um, Mersra uh, Baradaran, and she's at U UC Irvine. And um, it's the color of money, black banks, and the racial wealth gap, which is interesting that you mention it because this year, this academic year for our distinguished lecture series, uh, the focus is on the racial wealth gap. And we are trying to bring uh, the author of Color of Money to campus, and it might be in a virtual format, obviously. Uh, is to she Indian? Up. Yes, I believe so. Uh -huh. Yes. Well, we have a um, an audience has a uh, audience member has a comment, um, and I will read it to you. It's uh, Delina Dia Means, and she says, "I feel like I almost know you personally. My father, who was about eight years your senior, used to tell me and other relatives that he used to walk you to school. Both of my parents were graduates of Straight College. My mother was a graduate of Dillard. I'm sure you were too young to remember him. His name was Ralph Hayward." Uh, we were so proud. We are so proud and appreciative of your courage and your heroic leadership. I'm afraid I'm not too young. I'm, I knew a Ralph Hayward, uh, who was a member of uh, Central Congregational Church, uh, and whose parents, well, my parents went to Straight College, and I went to Dillon for a year. Uh, okay. So they. He's home, folks, and God bless him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we have another question. Um, this question is from um, uh, Robert Farrell, and it says, do you recall your work among the Rotary Club uh, in Montgomery addressing segregation? And how do you see the role of the Rotary in engaging issues raised by the Black Lives Matter movement today? Uh, let me well, just add one I, thing, uh, Ambassador. Robert Farrell was a city councilman here in Los Angeles for many years in the 8th District. He represented my mother. He also uh, wanted me to, rem to rem remind you of a woman named Gwen Green. Who I know Gwen. Involved. Yeah. Gwen is still right, alive. Sorry. Pardon me? It, it, Gwen is still kicking. Yeah, she's 95 years old. I know. <laughs> Tell her hello for me. We will. I'm sorry, Ambassador. Please a answer your question. Would you like me to repeat it, Ambassador? Yeah. Okay, so the question again is, do you recall your work among the Rotarians in Montgomery addressing yeah. segregation? And how do you see the role for the Rotary in engaging issues raised by the Black Lives Matter movement today? Well, I tell you what, Rotary is very important because it represents what we've come to call civil society. Now, I've been talking about uh, politics and economics mostly, uh, but uh, <clears throat> the Rotarians are not openly political, but they are opinion makers almost anywhere they live. Uh, it was Rotarians worldwide that helped us, uh, or that we worked with, uh, to put a, an end to polio around the world. Uh, and uh, Rotary is a worldwide organization and race and economic in injustice is a global problem. And so civil society 
can be very, very important. Uh, now, when I went to talk to Rotary in uh, Montgomery, I thought I was talking to the local Rotary and I got there and it was a conference of the middle American region of Rotaries. And it covered 13 states uh, up the Mississippi River. And so I talked to them about problems that I know about as a result of being born in New Orleans, that the climate crisis that we talked about briefly is probably most dangerous for us now in that district along the Mississippi River. There are 29 states that border the Mississippi River and its tributaries. And the Mississippi River floods almost every year somewhere and does a tremendous amount of damage. Uh, and they haven't done anything to work on those levees and the infrastructure of the river uh, since 1936 when it was put in. And I remember that because uh, I remember the CCC camps, the Civilian Conservation Corps, mm -hmm. and they, they these were thousands of young black men uh, who descended on the South uh, from uh, big cities in the North and, and South, and they built those levees. Uh, but they're built by hand, and they're mostly just earth levees and sandbag levees. And when the river gets flooded, and I, I watch the weather reports regularly because there's 96 cities that border along the Mississippi River. And every year, you know, 25 or 30 of them flood. Uh, and to have a flood while we're already fighting a virus and have our small business and essential workers overloaded, uh, it would do to the river, the cities along the river, what the fires are doing in California. Those fires are serious for everybody in the United States of America. And it, it doesn't have to burn down your house. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a representative of well, you, you, nobody in, in in the fires of California will argue with you very much about climate change. Uh, it's a given. Uh, and it's something we could have solved. Like Jimmy Carter had, uh, when he was president, had gotten the automobile industry to agree that by now, the average, the fleet average would have been something like getting 38 miles to a gallon of gas. Uh, that would mean we probably would have moved closer to electric cars and everything else. But um, when Ronald Reagan became president, he repealed all of the things that Carter had done to try to help the world prepare for global warming and climate change. Uh, he just canceled, roll, rolled all of that back. Uh, so we got fires. When, well, we might, I don't know. I don't know. We're, just, we're just in trouble. Yeah. But it's a crisis that is also an opportunity. All right, thank you again, Ambassador. Uh, we really appreciate your insight, your uh, experience, uh, your firsthand accounts. 
I'm going to take this uh, time to introduce our um, closing speaker who will be giving closing remarks, uh, Deborah Roberson. Um, she is a graduate of UCLA. Uh, she attended UCLA where she received a scholarship to run track and had a, she majored in political science. She's a graduate of Howard uh, University School of Law and she spent 20 years in the Cal State system, nine of which uh, she served as associate or assistant, I'm sorry, vice president of human uh, resources at Dominguez Hills. And the last year, so her current year, uh, she spent as chief of staff to President Parham. So without further ado, uh, Deborah. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Um, as as um, Dr. Nickel mentioned, I'm the chief of staff to the president, Thomas Parham. He is unable to be here today, otherwise he would be making these closing statements. He is one of three African-American presidents in the California State University system, the 11th president at Dominguez Hills. And of the 23 campuses, Dominguez Hills is the most diverse um, campus. And I wanted to mention that um, the crises that you mentioned, all three or four of them, and actually there are more than that here at this university, has revealed opportunities that Dominguez Hills is taking advantage of. And you had mentioned the um, technology um, advancements that are making it possible for us to be on this Zoom call today, making it possible for our faculty to be able to serve the many students that we have. And I wanted to mention that our student body base and aggregate is high in four distinct areas. And that is, we have predominantly minority students that are high in Pell Grant eligible, eligibility, high in first generation students, and high in students requiring some level of remediation to better manage the rigors of the university. But President Parham always states that circumstances are places where people come from, but they are not who they are at the core of their being. And there's a tremendous amount of talent in the students that we serve here at Dominguez Hills. We're honored that you've taken the time to connect with our Dominguez Hills community during this unprecedented convergence of crises. And during this time of um, physical distancing, Ollie has continued to offer virtual educational, cultural, and social opportunities. But the master plan allowed you to be with us at this moment. And with, it's with heartfelt gratitude that we are thankful that you've shared your time with us and provided us your firsthand insights. And today, you are Toro. And we have a saying in, at Dominguez Hills and Toro Nation. Once a Toro, always a Toro. Thank you. I think I did the commencement there one year. Did you when President Hagen was here? I don't know. It was a good while back. Ten years ago, um, sir, you okay. you were on, on campus. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ambassador Young, it's been a real slice of heaven. Thank you for joining us. Yes, Ambassador. Um, we want to thank you for joining, um, for joining us. Uh, we are truly appreciative of this. Sir, are there any other closing remarks you'd like to share? No, just that uh, I'm glad that uh, you've given me this opportunity and you were kind of light on me in terms of the questions and nobody disagreed with me on anything. Uh, but I hope it, it was not just your being polite. I hope, I hope I was communicating, but if anybody really thinks that um, you didn't get a chance to correct me, um, well, my address is uh, 260 14th Street, <laughs> <laughs> Northwest Atlanta, Georgia, 30318. Or you can look it up and you can find all that and you all know how to do that. Google it or something. Yes, sir. We will be sharing your information online. Let me ask you, what projects are you currently working on? I understand you're getting some of your documents together currently. Is that true? Well, we're, we're working on, well, um, 
I, I decided that uh, when I turned 75, that uh, I needed to work on the things that I had, uh, I'd sort of not given enough attention to. And they were basically the things that I thought that, uh, well, that, that, that when you get to the pearly gates, this is what the New Testament says, the Lord is gonna ask you, did you feed the hungry? Did you clothe the naked? Did you heal the sick? Did you visit those in prison? Set at liberty those who were oppressed. Uh, proclaim the acceptable year of our Lord. And so we built our foundation around the kinds of things that, uh, well, feeding the hungry is not just, you know, food baskets for right now, but uh, we're not going to be able to get we might not be able to get food that we've been not getting from California uh, back here in Georgia in a few years. Uh, so uh, finding a way to feed a planet that is growing from about 7 billion people and that we'll be getting to 9 billion people uh, we won't be able to grow food in dirt um, like we're doing it now. And so we've been working on hydroponics and aquaponics, uh, alternative ways of producing food uh, for the world. And um, that's one thing. And, and uh, there are just some projects uh, the Mississippi River is one of our projects. Uh, in Atlanta, we didn't have any money um, when I became mayor, but I, I found that you could get money from overseas. But there's money all around the world. And if you can have an efficient, um, honest, um, and profitable environment, uh, and safe, you can attract business. So first, my, my time as mayor, uh, we we moved 1,100 companies from all over the world into Atlanta. Um, and um, we attracted about $70 billion worth of foreign direct investment. Because uh, there was no money in Washington under Reagan. Uh, or he wasn't giving it to the cities anymore. Uh, and so we went to Wall Street. And most of our projects we've done with tax-exempt municipal bonds. Uh, so our airport and our stadiums and the Olympics, uh, we didn't use any taxpayer money. And so uh, I've been trying to get the cities along the Mississippi River not to wait for the Corps of Engineers and the federal government to stop them from flooding, but to find ways to develop projects that will pay for themselves, make money and create jobs uh, with private capital. And so I, I just took a lot of the things that I've been doing in Africa and, in, uh, and as mayor and we're trying to share them with other cities. So it, it keeps me busy. And um, Dr. King used to say that uh, you have to be certifiably insane uh, to think that, uh, and we were all under 30, that this crazy bunch of young folk can change this nation. And he said, the chances are we won't make it to 40. Um, but he said, if we make it to 40, we're gonna have to make it to 100 because there's that much work to be done. Well, he didn't make it to 40. He made it barely to 39. And so I felt that I had to find a way to try to continue his work 
And uh, as long as I have energy and technology, uh, I probably couldn't have gotten on a plane to get out to California nearly as easy as I could get up from my lunch. And it's, it's three o'clock here now, almost four. Uh, and, um, and, and be with you. Well, sir, we greatly appreciate oh, that. Thank you very much. And we do want to be aware of your time, ladies and gentlemen. We have gone over our time by 41 minutes. We appreciate everyone's um, joining us. That um, act yes, sir. Did someone say something? I'm sorry. I thought I heard something else. Was that you, Ambassador Young? Were you saying sharing something else? No, thanks. Okay. All right. So that is actually the conclusion of our um, this afternoon's presentation. We hope that you all will continue to join us as we continue on with this presentation next week, um, Tuesday, August 25th. Um, Dr. Nichols will be joining us and contextualizing everything that Ambassador Young spoke about. Um, this is something that she brings to her students in Africana studies, and she's also going to be bringing it to our OLLI members. The Zoom ID is right here, the meeting ID. Please register and join. And I thank you all for participating. That's the conclusion of our presentation. Thank you, Ms. Bacata. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And thank you again to um, everyone, all of our collaborators. Um, the President's Office Extended Ed Negotiation Conflict Resolution, Dr. Brian Jarrett, we appreciate you being here. Um, Ambassador Rose, Dr. Nichols, thank you for making this happen. Also in working with Ali um, in the NCRP department and just making it happen. We appreciate you. Ambassador Young, I'm in your part of the country right now. So, okay. <laughs> so yes, sir. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Ambassador. Okay, and God bless you all. God yes, bless sir. You. God bless you. Thank you.